Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dan Smith. I'm president and CEO of the Vermont Community Foundation. And in that role, I serve on the board of the Vermont Council on Rural Development. And I've had the privilege of being part of the steering committee thinking about uh, the Vermont proposition and the future of Vermont. Uh, and helped uh, with some of the work that led up to this summit today. Uh, our conversation today is really to focus on this question of uh, advancing efficiency and foresight through state planning and re regional coordination. And we've got a wonderful panel of folks here uh, to talk about that. Uh, the interesting thing about this particular piece of the proposition to me is that so much, of, so many of the others are focused on the what of what might be in Vermont. And this is really focusing on the how. Uh, and that's an important distinction. Um, how we might focus on uh, and how we might function as a civic enterprise with greater foresight and intentionality over time through stronger planning functions and greater coordination. Uh, full disclosure, my job as a facilitator is to periodically nudge the conversation and I may overstate things for the sake of provocation and keeping the dialogue floating. I just wanna make sure that we all leave here with some things to think about uh, as we look out over the coming years in Vermont. Uh, I think this experience of the last year really compels us to address what is fragile in Vermont communities and think about how we solve those things over the time it takes to solve those things in a sustainable way and permanently. Uh, and how different structures might create space for progress on the factors that drive that community vulnerability. Things like our long-term demographics, aging state systems, lagging rural economies and structural and race, racial and economic inequality, uh, climate change. When we think about 2050, 29 years from today, the trends affecting the state right now uh, will require thinking and planning and discipline. Oh, looks like we lost Dan for a second. Um, Dan, if you can hear us, you are frozen momentarily. Let's hope. Um, panelists, are you, I see other folks moving. Are you, is Dan frozen for everybody as well? Okay. It looks like one of those that's going to turn into a disappearance of Dan. Honestly, and I wonder if we should go to Beth for kind of a history of, there it goes. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, yeah, let's hope that Dan rejoins shortly. Um, I have nowhere near the eloquence that <laughs> he does, but I'm happy to sort of step forward in this moment. And I think that's a great idea. I mean, the plan, I think, was to go to you, Beth, um, to sort of give us a, an overview, a sort of jumping off point. Oh, looks like Dan's back. Um, but so did I just, did I just get bounced off? A little bit, yeah. Right. But, um, sorry about that. I'm not quite sure why I just got bounced off Zoom. It just sort of can't uh, end itself on the, uh, <clears throat> uh, on my screen. Um, so let me, let me, let me uh, bag on the rest of the uh, discussion. I was just reflecting, if we think about 2050, what was going on in Vermont 29 years ago, a uh, Vermonter of median age was 13 years old. Most of us had yet to open an email account and Amazon had yet to be founded. Although the Vermont country store was uh, 46 years old. Vermont driver's licenses didn't even have pictures on them. Um, and education was funded on a town by town basis. So a lot has changed in 29 years and a lot can change in the next 29. So, some housekeeping, uh, I would just draw everybody's attention if you need it to the closed captioning button. Uh, and I encourage you, if you need it to participate in uh, to, to stream the transcript. Um, and second, I just wanna invite uh, our panelists to introduce themselves briefly, uh, just uh, your name, your background, where your work, how planning ties into your work. Um, and just for the sake of those Vermonters who are uh, maybe visually, visually impaired or blind, just a little bit about your appearance. I'm, um, you know, short, short brown hair that's receding more than I'd like it to. And my, uh, I'm in my office right now with a relatively bland uh, background. So um, <clears throat> I look forward to the discussion. We'll dive into questions once folks introduce themselves. So let's go with uh, Senator Rahm for the first introduction. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, so I am State Senator Keisha Rahm. Um, I have uh, cared, a, I mean, for those of you who are watching, you're big nerds like we are. So thank you for being with us because we don't talk enough about 
planning and how important it is to accomplish so many other things um, in, in government. And I say in government because we know planning is a really critical component of any organization. And often, um, you know, you think about research and development in businesses, you think about strategic planning and nonprofits and all kinds of entities. And for some reason, government is particularly stymied when trying to think long term. And that's unfortunate for Vermonters and Americans, although many other states have planning offices. Um, I'll leave that part to Beth, uh, but Senate um, Representative Bloomley and I um, have introduced companion bills in the House and the Senate around recreating, reconstituting a state planning office. So that's probably why we're here and we also care about good government. Um, for those of you who may not know, I guess I would physically describe myself as a, as a brown person wearing a light green <laughs> sweater um, at my home in Shelburne. Um, I am the first woman of color to serve in the state Senate and, you know, very proud of that. And a, a big component for us of planning is civic engagement and making sure that more voices are heard. We have better data to know who's being left behind. Um, so you can't really advance equity without good planning. Um, and that's been a really important component for us. Thanks, Senator. Um, let's go with Beth Humstone next. Hi, I'm Beth Humstone. I am here at my camp in Charlotte, um, and I'm happy to be here. I've been working for, I was just saying, nearly half a century now on planning in Vermont. I'm a planning nerd, as Keisha would say, um, and um, very happy to be here today. I've had a lot of different roles in the state of Vermont, from running a consulting business to starting the Vermont Forum on Sprawl with John Ewing to chairing the Board of Housing Conservation Trust Fund and VNRC. So lots of background in various aspects of planning in Vermont. Great. Thanks, Beth. Tiff Bloomley. Hi, uh, I'm Tiff Bloomley and uh, I newly elected legislator from Chittenden 6-5, which is uh, representing the Burlington South End. And I sit in the House of Representatives uh, and, and did so remotely this session, which was a very interesting experience. I uh, have, as an, before, prior to that, I've been an advocate for gender equity and um, women who are um, in the correctional system. And, uh, and I, through the work that we did, I saw a lot of things that weren't working. Um, you know, databases that didn't talk to one another, um, the state, um, uh, priorities that shifted uh, every two years, um, um, you know, individual agencies that would um, decide to dismantle what the prior administration had just done. And, um, and my, though I'm not as much of probably as a, of a wonk, as Keisha and Beth may be, uh, I saw that planning a long, no, I couldn't find the ways in which government was really thinking long term. And that was a, that was very difficult for me in order to do the work that I wanted to do. So uh, to describe uh, myself, um, I am uh, almost 60. I have a lot of silver hair and um, I'm the shortest one in my family at five, six. Thanks, Tiff. Uh, Justin Johnson. Thanks, Dan. Uh, so uh, my, my name is Justin Johnson. Um, I'm coming to you from my house in Barry, Vermont. Um, as you can tell from my accent, I didn't grow up here, although I've been here for about 23 years now. So it feels very much like home. Um, I look a lot like a lot of other Vermonters, actually, middle-aged white guy. <laughs> um, I don't feel middle-aged, but I'm starting to look that way, I think. Uh, so I've had a, uh, you know, I work for MMR, which is a lobbying firm in Montpelier, but prior to that, I had a long um, career in government, both in Vermont state government, but also working in the federal government and state government and local government in Australia. Uh, so... Uh, it's been an interesting sort of perspective to see the different approaches to planning at different levels of government and in different countries. Keeping in mind, I come from a country the size of the continental U.S. with a population of New York State 
that has seven police forces and six school districts. Uh, you know, now there's a pros and cons to all of those things. I think my view of planning and, and approach to government generally is that on some level, it doesn't matter what structure you decide to use. It's more about how you use it and how you think about it and where you place people in that structure. Um, but, you know, I, in Vermont, I've worked at the Agency of Agriculture, the Agency of Natural Resources, and then was Secretary of Administration during the Shumlin uh, portion of the Sh Shumlin administration. So I've certainly been involved um, in Vermont as we struggle I think I look at the, the flag and I see freedom and unity and that always seems to be slightly at odds with each other. And I think every day I, in government, I could see that playing out as we try to work out how to move together um, and achieve things as a group while at the same time um, being sort of individual, individualistic and, and free as it were. Uh, so I look forward to the conversation. Thanks very much. Great, Justin, thank you. And so my hope is to just facilitate a pretty lively dialogue between everybody. We've got a, um, a range of experiences and perspectives on, on the panel, and then we'll start checking the chat with probably 20 minutes uh, twenty minutes to go so we can, uh, get, or the Q&A, so we, we can begin to pick up questions from participants. Um, but I want to start with Beth Humstone. Um, Beth has a long, long experience, a long career, uh, in you know in planning um, in the nonprofit sector and the non-governmental and consulting, but actually uh, you know worked in the state planning office when we had one, and I'd love to ground you to ground us a bit in the history of uh, the role that office played and your perspective on the ways in which that functions in some other states. Sure, I'm sorry I forgot to identify um, myself. I'm a senior white woman with graying, getting their gray hair. Um, so I came to Vermont in 1973 because it had a state planning office and it was actually doing state planning. I looked at three states, Oregon, Hawaii, and Vermont, all of three of whom were doing advanced work in planning. And I just written my thesis on state planning and regional coordination. So I was very excited about <laughs> coming to Vermont. And here I am 50 years later, still talking about this subject. <laughs> I don't know what that says, um, but, uh, the state planning office, I eventually was able to land a job there in 76, and Tom Salmon was the governor. And um, we really did do planning. We had um, population economic forecasting for the whole state. We shared that with the regional planning commissions. We shared it with every state agency. We cooperated with state agencies. So in terms of foresight, we were gathering the information that would enable people to plan, whether it's at the state agency level or the regional level. In addition to that, we had extensive mapping that was going on. We were getting ready to um, for a state land use plan, which never came to be, but we mapped the capability of the land in the state of Vermont region by region for development. And um, so there was extensive mapping that was to be a basis for planning in Vermont as well. And in addition, um, there used to be a lot more federal money coming into the state of Vermont until the 80s. And um, this money uh, was reviewed by the state planning office in cooperation with the individual state agencies and the regional planning commissions. And we, we this is through Jimmy Carter. This is something President Carter set up. Um, and we checked every single major federal dollars came into the state and looked at them in terms of whether or not they complied with our state policies, mainly our state policies for land use, conservation, development, affordable housing, transportation that were in place. And I can tell you that through that process, we stopped a lot of really bad projects, but we also supported some good projects that helped to revitalize our downtowns and our, our village centers, for example, and helped to conserve some of the important agricultural lands in the state. So we had this whole process set up and it was working. Um, in addition to that, um, after uh, Governor Salmon left and Governor Snelling came into office, um, we pretty much stopped that review process, but we still worked on coordinating with the state agencies. And in particular, we coordinated on major developments that happened in the state. And the biggest one that happened was our first regional shopping mall ever proposed in 1978. 
And that Snelling, Governor Snelling assembled a review team of all the state agencies that were affected, transportation, agency of natural resources, planning, um, economic development, so forth, uh, to review the project and to see what its impact on the state of Vermont would be. So we would coordinate state public investments. We would forecast, we would look ahead and look at our needs. And um, we would also convene over major developments and bring state agencies together over major developments. Um, and I think the process worked well. I look at the sheet that was handed out for the session um, and it says, we have a state planning office, we could build better and longer term community economic and land use planning than has ever been effectively done in Vermont. Go, I say, because we have done it, make it even better. I'm sure there's so many ways that we could improve upon that now with all, all we know and all the different challenges we, we have today. Unfortunately, the office was disbanded. Um, we do have requirements for state agencies to plan. Act 200 required state agency plans. Um, they did them for a while, um, but that stopped um, back in the 90s. That's not done anymore. Um, we also required the state to um, as, uh, council regional commissions to review regional plans and to make sure they complied with state policies. That doesn't happen anymore either. So there's a lot of coordination that we used to have in the state that does not exist anymore. Some of it is still built into our laws, um, but some of it, as the two senators on the panel know, requires some new legislation to bring back. Thanks, Beth. Um, <clears throat> Tiff, uh, Keisha, uh, how, in, in your view and your experience in the legislature and, and, and Tiff going back in terms of your work in the nonprofit sector and it changed the story, you know, when you think about how decision-making or strategy from a public perspective and a private perspective, you know, what, what, how do you see that uh, a, a planning function playing out um, uh, playing out vis-a-vis -vis how you would approach, uh, how the legislature might approach things and how the administration might. And Justin, I invite you to jump in on that as well, can background as Secretary of Administration and the agency. Like, what, what, would, what would a strong planning function al allow, uh, allow our civic structure to be able to provide? If you want to start. Who wants to go first? Sorry. I can, start. Yeah, great. I can start, sure. Um, I mean, I, just as uh, funding streams are siloed, so is planning. And there are so many, none of the issues that this conference will discuss uh, is, distinct from another. And unless we approach uh, problem solving and vision setting uh, from an integrated perspective, we will create problems that we didn't anticipate because we weren't considering the impact on other sectors, other people, um, uh, other resources. And I, you know, just take the world of workforce development, which I know pretty well, all of that funding is siloed across a number of different agencies who, <clears throat> and a lot of that funding is federal. It comes with its own federal rules uh, and, um, goals. And for as long as I have been here in the state, we have never been able to really achieve an integrated, coordinated, um, mutually reinforced workforce development strategy. Uh, everybody's, and, and I think we have tried, and there are people who worked really hard to try to get there. And yet for some for various reasons, um, if that hasn't, if from my perspective, that hasn't been possible. And so I think that if, there are ways to ask for federal waivers, for example, 
um, on funding that that comes with the federal money and that the, you can get waivers on the terms that's that are um, associated with that money so that you can pilot new things or meet particular state needs and generally speaking we don't ask for those waivers and we're not doing that in part because we're not having conversations really across agencies pools of money uh, the agency of education is quite distinct and separate from AHS, from DOL, and, uh, and the Agency um, of Commerce, and <clears throat> all of whom kind of reflect different priorities and needs. So uh, it, it, I think, I mean, that's just one example um, of how I, I think we could have a much stronger and, and more focused and leveraged approach to workforce development. Uh, had somebody who could kind of mediate or, or uh, convene. Thank you, convene, <laughs> right. Convene and also help to find the common ground that, you know, these different agencies have and or, or could aspire to so that, so that we could really um, do more than we've been able to do over the last 25 years since I've been here. If you and yeah, I first I yeah, no, Keisha, jump in. Sorry. Oh, is that when you two met, or is it? <laughs> well, we, we we first met working on a strategic plan for workforce called known as the Next Generation Report and Commission, which was a uh, tended to be a five year plan that ended up guiding state decisions for. I think uh, uh, they may still be sort of in in play right now, uh, 16, 17 years later. So. Um, mm -hmm. It's a point well taken that um, we don't necessarily ask the question about whether objectives are being met and adapt our adapt those objectives over time. So, um, Keisha, sorry, I didn't mean to jump in, but um, no, no, yeah, I think you know it's. It, even though I'm now the youngest woman in history in the state Senate, I've been in government for 13 years. <laughs> and, you know, it, we are circling around the same conversation, so it's all relevant. And I think, you know, if I would just underscore what Tiff said. There is no statewide entity charged with convening, informing, and supporting the prioritization of all of these initiatives, efforts, you know, sort of regional development projects, um, so that we have something cohesive at the at the state level. And if you ask, for example, the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, which a lot of us have been involved in the Working Communities Challenge about regional growth, you know, they would say that distressed communities can absorb a lot more capital if there are efforts to convene and align and develop a shared set of priorities and a consistent stakeholder group to advance those. Every regional planning commission is kind of a, a you know, island unto itself. We have, you know, very little control. We sometimes give them money and ask a lot of them, so I don't want to, you know, disparage them in any way, but there's, there's no standardization, there's no evenness if they decide, you know, that they want to sort of share priorities and ideas they can, but we used to have a state planning office, as Beth said, that would help, you know, coordinate that and coordinate what we were doing regionally in economic development and, and general land use and development. Um, you know, to what Beth said, I don't remember us competing in that way and saying this will be the best thing that's ever happened. I don't know who exactly said that, but we do have the support of the Planners Association and many planners around the state. And I would say there's two camps, you know, the very small camp that say, please bring it back and a bigger camp that say we never knew we had it. Um, and if you look around the country, the, at the time that, you know, I'm not going to say which governor because there's you know, people who, who point to both parties. Um, but at the time that we dissolved most state planning functions, other states looked at their more land use based state planning office and said, this needs to do more. This needs to collect all kinds of data, be a convener, in, you know, integrate with the budget, um, give us long-term thinking, give us that, that more regional and intergovernmental capacity, break down the silos as we're hearing in the chat. That's around the same time we thought, oh, we're good. <laughs> like we don't need any of that. And so as other states have developed really comprehensive planning, I think we're still stuck in a holding pattern of saying, let's ask the state archivist where that report is or you know, how to build on work that has in some ways been forgotten unless you go to the few people with institutional memory left in our system. And that's really unfortunate for Vermonters. Um, so, you know, just to sort of build on 
Beth's point around that. Um, and we, I just have to say this and, you know, could get in trouble, but we are terrible at data collection in Vermont. I mean, federally out of compliance, terrible. You know, federal law requires us to have language access plans and to build equity, uh, equity lens into so much of our work when we receive federal funds. We are out of compliance in that regard. And if you ask anyone in a, in a county or municipal setting, they'll say, great, can the state tell me which are the most popular languages spoken in my county so I can get into compliance? And we don't even have that information. I love Erica Borneman at, you know, who does state emergency planning. Um, and I said to her in the middle of the pandemic, Erica, I get Vermont alert, right? I get this system that tells me in English that there's a pipe broken in Hinesburg, which that is important, but we're in the middle of a pandemic and I have not gotten any health information in the pandemic from Vermont alert and Everbridge, our little alert system in the state. I don't know if there's any way I can get this in another language, but I can't imagine we'd be the first state to ask for this information in another language. How do we actually have emergency planning that's comprehensive? And the first thing she did is she reached out to the vendor and they said, yes, New York City obviously already asked for pandemic information in other languages. And they're, they, you know, within a week, they started working on doing that for Vermont. We have to, this is, this is going to become life or death for Vermont as we face, you know, more uncertain climate events, as we think about an, another disaster like the one we've just been through, where you need to know your population, the languages they speak, the needs they have, where they are, and how you can support them. And we don't have that information. And we're behind the federal government, a lot of other states in, you know, prioritizing that kind of level of knowledge about how we're best serving Vermonters. So, I, you know, if you, if you give me long enough, I get really passionate about the fact that poor planning means that we don't do our jobs well in state government and as legislators. Poor planning, it seems like it also raises the stakes on every individual decision either legislators or administrations are asked to, to make because, because they, they exist outside of a sense of progress towards a, a shared objective or an identified objective. Um, all of those decisions are then harder to make and the stakes seem higher because they don't, they're not nested in a strategy to address some of our deepest and most systemic challenges. Joseph, I'm curious, given your experience both, you know, internationally and the federal government and, and in Vermont, you know, how, um, do, you, do you want to weigh in on, you know, the, the presence or absence of the, guide, the guiding infrastructure of a plan and, and how that's, uh, what, what your experience was with it, how it affected your uh, ability to administer? Absolutely. So, I think one of the challenges that Vermont has is it's sometimes too big to be small and too small to be big. We're sort of in this. So by that, I mean, you know, we, we get very nervous about investing a lot of money into government infrastructure because, you know, we're a small state and we can, you know, we don't need to have another office here, another office. We can just handle it with what we've got where there's a sort of mentality around that. And yet, the issues we're dealing with and the challenges for the people who live here are getting more complex all the time. And I think the big risk that we have, and I certainly saw it when I was Secretary of Administration, is the, the transactional cost of, of doing anything in government goes up when you don't have the consistency and the sort of continuity and the sort of end vision that a plan can bring you. Because what happens is not every decision that's made works for everybody all the time. The only way to make decisions that consistently work for everybody over a period of time is to say, we're going to do this piece now, and then we're going to do this piece, and then we're going to do this piece. And that only works if people know what the vision is and feel confident that that's where you're going to go. By not having plans, what happens is, and you know, whether it's a small decision, you know, in a state government agency or between cabinet members, you know, between secretaries or a, a big development in Act 250, what happens when you don't have any plan is that everybody says subconsciously or consciously, I have to get everything I can out of this decision because I have no idea what the next one's going to look like. I don't know what the next budget's going to look like. I'm going to get all the money I can for my agency right now. 
putting aside the fact that we might have a real problem somewhere else and the right thing to, the right thing to do would be to say i'm going to give up some of what i could get today because it's better for everyone if you get it today and then i get something tomorrow that only happens when you have plans and i think that's the bit that i found frustrating is it was like absent a bigger picture every decision was like a zero sum game and you had to get whatever you could and and as I said, you saw that in different levels all the way through the system. And I think that adds a lot of cost, transactional cost to our building of a society. Uh, yeah, I just, can I respond to that a little? I think we've got sort of three challenges and opportunities right now. And one is that we've got the 2020 census that's going to come out. And what are we going to do with that data? How are we going to analyze that data? How are we going to distribute that data and make sure people, it's part of the planning that goes on in the state? The second is we may have a huge influx of federal money for infrastructure, whatever infrastructure ends up being defined as. Where's that money going to go? What, how is it going to reflect our priorities and what are our priorities? And um, third is just the whole recovery from COVID and what is that going to look like and you know if you look at things like economic development in this state how many more office buildings are we going to plan in this state you know where are we going to where should our industry be what's what's our future going to look like in in that area given what we've learned after going through COVID and at the same time how are we going to address this incredible shortage of housing that we have right now. So we have this whole recovery um, from COVID to, and not to mention the health concerns on top of that. So I think we have some very specific needs right now that really point to the importance of state coordination and coordination with the regional level as well. Um, I, th I think you're absolutely could. So the pandemic accelerated so many of the factors that we knew were challenges for Vermont communities from a perspective of, you know, fragile local and rural economies, from the issues of race and economic inequality, from issues of climate and housing, you know, and the question is, you know, how do we, how do we aspire to get back uh, to a place that's uh, of much greater resilience than the pandemic found us in? And that's going to take, in my view, that, that will take longer than you know, that'll take longer than a year or two, right? That requires some planning and then the execution uh, uh, according to that plan over time. I'm curious, just uh, uh, if anybody wants to jump, jump in, you know, we talked a bit about workforce, we talked about housing. You know, what are the other, you know, bigger sort of systemic challenges? You know, how do you see it as policymakers and, and uh, how do you see um, a plan, you know, a planning exercise? Uh, uh, where, do you, where do you see the key areas of focus coming um, where, where do you see key areas coming into focus that would be embedded? And then there's a question I just saw pop up in the chat that I'm gonna I'm gonna invite. You know, there's how we address planning uh, and balance the interests of local and regional and and, and state objectives um, in the context of the exercise of building a, a plan that allows us to see feel a sense of common purpose and common objective. So there are two two questions. What, what what are our biggest priorities if we were to outline our you know plan looking out thirty years, and then and then two, how do we balance local, regional, and state you know interests and needs? Yeah, um, you know I'll just jump in to say I mean often planning should tell us what our biggest priority should be because absent that, as Justin said, you know then it gets filled with a vacuum of who's the most articulate legislator, or who's the best you know most savvy department head. Um, when we know that, you know, for example, with transportation, a quarter of Vermonters can't get to a doctor's appointment or a grocery store when they need to. That should stop all of us in our tracks to say, you know, that's what needs to happen in transportation. How do we reach those folks? And often I think to that local government question, to the sort of systemic questions, um, you know, often the communities that have the most professional staff are the ones that get the most resources, whether or not they're the most distressed, because usually the most distressed communities, you know, don't have political alignment. They, you know, are not seeking out state and federal grants as much. They're not savvy about getting a pilot going on transportation in their community. So I've been really impressed with efforts like Sue Minters at Capstone to say, how do we do some like ride sharing and, and technology disruptive transportation solutions? And let's do it in Barrie. 
And let's, you know, go to Barrie and say, we want to do it here because there are transportation barriers here, not wait for Montpelier or Burlington or somewhere to say, oh, well, we'll try it out. And then it never gets anywhere else because it's not replicable if it starts in the communities that have the most infrastructure and personnel and never gets to the Newports, the Rutlands, the, the, so, you know, and to add to that, someone asked a question about, you know, what about housing? And, you know, I, I introduced legislation on environmental justice and environmental health this year, which is an EPA requirement. And we're very behind the, you know, other states on this again. Um, but this is an area where we, you know, we just learned in the aftermath, for example, that mobile home park residents might make up 8% of the population, but 40% of those affected by Hurricane Irene. Well, the EPA has mapping information they want to share with us about flood data and what areas are most prone to flooding, what other issues that's going to cause mold in basements, you know, un uninhabit uninhabitable housing, et cetera. Um, we're not using the tools federally available to us to understand the communities that are most distressed, that have the combination of poor housing quality, transportation barriers, and, you know, health issues like asthma, et cetera. That's pretty standard and basic now in the country to have that information on hand in your communities and to know that. And we still don't know that. And I'm telling you, it really drives legislators, some, some of us nerds as legislators, you know, really nuts when people say, you know, well, we, we want money for this. Well, who gets it first? And it, you better be the most distressed communities. You better know who those are, not oh, we're really excited because, you know, this community put in a proposal and we, we still don't feel like we're there with data-informed decision-making at the highest levels. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest challenges is, is climate change and um, how that's going to affect our communities as well. And, and as Keisha referred to, who gets impacted by climate change? And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to me, this goes back to looking at land use in the state because we have spread out as a state so much from when we started planning in the 70s for the future of Vermont. We have really spread our communities out. That's one reason it's so hard to do transportation planning in the state is because we now have a medical office facility out in the middle of nowhere with no bus service. And so there are decisions like that that are, that are getting made. But um, related to climate change, there's been studies that indicate that you can have the most well-insulated net zero house with a Prius out in the middle of nowhere, and you can have the same thing in an urban center, and you are gonna be using a lot less energy in the urban center than you are in an outlying area. So we, you know, we, nobody is talking about the land use implications of climate change. If we continue to spread out, that's going to place demands on our roads. It's going to um, and it preclude our ability to address some of these transportation issues that you're talking about. And um, that contributes to our greenhouse gas emissions. So we really, we need to think about these in concert, all of these things in concert to address that issue. Yeah. I could, yeah, I could not agree um, more with um, the two of you. And I, I think about, so, so I put an, I posted an article that I think is um, <clears throat> a really interesting one in terms of uh, problem, uh, approach, how to approach problems that are interconnected. Um, Beth Solin of Climate Interactive uh, is, you know, somebody I follow all the time because I just think her brain is so interesting. And the, um, <clears throat> the, the, she, she calls this approach that they use at Climate Interactive multi-solving. And it's, you know, it, it, you take something like the farm to plate initiative, right? <clears throat> and so, well, what was, what was that initiative trying to do? Well, it depends on where you stand, right? For some, it's about access to healthy food. To others, it's about protecting and improving our land and water resources. Just to others, it's about reducing the carbon footprint of agriculture. Um, for others, it's the agricultural economy and making helping it to grow and um, 
guaranteeing jobs for people in agriculture over time and, and wages to support that. So, and I, there are ways in which I think, oh, I, you know, I, I always, oh, well, my committee deals with housing and the way I think about, I have to ask, I have to start with questions. What are the questions that we need to be asking? And like, how, how is this related to, <clears throat> to something else? And, um, and I, I guess what I'm trying to say, and maybe not being very articulate in saying, but is that, that before uh, choosing a particular issue, you recognize that, wow, all these issues, many, at least most of them are interconnected. And so what do we need, who do we need to talk to to understand that interconnectedness? And how might that then shape our approach so that we are not further siloing our advocacy efforts, our funding, et cetera? <clears throat> Thanks, Tiff. Um, you know, I, I think uh, embedded in a bunch of in, in your responses is this idea that, you know, uh, with good data and a structured uh, structured planning exercise and, and, and planning capacity is this idea that we can start the process without preconceptions about how, where a plan might take us. You know, we, we may have some systemic ideas and systemic objectives, but data can guide us. And, um, and we need, and we're way behind to hear Senator um, and, you know, we're way behind in the development and incorporation of data into our decision making. I want to begin to turn to um, some of the uh, questions that are in the chat uh, and in the Q&A. And if you could, anybody who's submitting questions, shift them to the Q&A. So I'm, I, I should have said that at the beginning, so I'm not checking multiple places. But I'm going to start. <clears throat> the first question is, uh, there, there's is two part and they're unrelated. Uh, one is, how do we incorporate the uh, health impact assessments um, into planning process to evaluate impacts related to well-being uh, indoor air, waste production, et cetera. And the second piece of that is how do we see town and state um, uh, zoning or land use regulations adapting to changes in desired uses of lands in you know, non-traditional buildings um, and things like that. Um, how do we, uh, you know, the question is really around, it uses the, uh, the, the word innovation. So um, <clears throat> anybody want to dive in on, you know, either the use of the health impact assessments uh, or uh, state zoning and, or state and municipal zoning. So I think the perhaps the, the somewhat tenuous common thread between those two is the data piece. I think, you know, and it's been raised a number of times here, we lack data all over the place. And part of that is, I think, because we've been through a period over the last 20 years of action you know it's all about action <laughs> no matter that we have no idea on what it is we're taking action because we don't want to collect information first but we're very big on action but you know data collection is just wasting time but i think so the connection is that um in order to i mean both looking at particularly at public health and health impacts across the region you've got to understand where you are and what sort of population you have, how are people impacted, how are their health impacted. Uh, and then on the other side, you know, innovation in, in whether it's building design, that sort of thing. The challenge is the government is not good at predicting things. I, we shouldn't really be in the business in government of predicting the outcome of things. What we should be doing is focusing on the performance and saying that, you know, whatever it is, it needs to sort of do these things. It needs to support people in our community in the following ways and sort of put, um, so rather than specify what something, everything about something, really talk about what it's going to do in the community. And, you know, I think that's the challenge in all of that is to bring enough data in and then bring people in so they can understand it and have a conversation around what the data is telling us. Because, I think that a lot of people tend to show up with a with their idea and then they just put it up against someone else's idea and it almost doesn't matter what the data says. And I think that's a real challenge. I mean, 
interestingly, the one place that we've been really successful as a state, and not every state does this, um, our consensus revenue forecast is a really good example of what can happen. You know, in some states, the legislature and the administration spend half the year arguing about what the revenue number is. What we do in Vermont, pretty successfully, I think, is the legislature through the emergency board, the money chair committee, committee chairs, the money committee chairs, and the and the governor's office through um, finance management get together with their um, economists and they come to a consensus on what the number is. So then we use that number to build the budget. We take that number and so we can have an argument all day long about what's the appropriate way to spend the number, but we're not wasting our time on what the number is. And some states spend as much time on what the number is as they do on what to do with the money. And I think that's an example where we could bring people together around data and try and get to some consensus on what we're dealing with that doesn't always happen. That's a great point. Beth, you, um, were you? I was gonna re just respond to the, the question about the zoning. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it's actually a fairly similar response to Justin. Um, you know, there, first of all, there is no state zoning. So um, just want to make that clear. There's no state zoning at all. We have Act 250, which is administered at a regional level that has a set of criteria that developments have to meet. And those criteria get reviewed all the time to see if they're up to date with what's going on. And I think there recently have been efforts in that regard that have not come to much that uh, Keisha and Tiff might be aware of. Um, but in terms of at the local level, it goes back to what Justin's saying. If you convene people in the community and you bring them the information about what is going on and show them the data about how something that is not anticipated at this time could be accommodated within their community, then that gives the community an opportunity to understand that and decide if they wanna make a change to adjust to that. So it's, it's sort of similar in that respect. But I think there's a lot of flexibility in terms of in our enabling laws to allow for many different creative approaches to zoning that we don't always utilize. Thanks, Beth. Um, I'm going to try, uh, Keisha. Are we, is, I don't know what time we end, so I was just going to make one um, more point, but it could be my last. Um, I'm going to look for, to Nick Kramer for a nod and say, I think we've got about uh, 15 more minutes. Is it, are we going to 3.15? I think we go to 315. Yeah, so we got a, we got a bunch of time. And um, so uh, I also want to acknowledge, I, before I give, give it back, I want to acknowledge that there are people who are uh, participants and watching this who are deeply involved in, 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 in regional planning and have a ton of expertise. So um, I appreciate your questions and the observations that are coming in through the chat and in the Q&A. Um, the, the, uh, I, want to, I want to tease a thread that just popped up in the Q&A, though, uh, and ask, actually, let me give. Let me defer to Keisha if you wanted to jump in on that collective that that line of thinking we were on before I surface something different. Well, the only thing that I, I wanted to add, and it goes back to your question about what have we not been discussing, you know, in general, um, is kind of the opposite of land use planning, which is digital government planning. And you know, how, it, it came up for me in the sense of we need data liberation. It needs to be really accessible to our decision makers below, you know, in other forms of government besides state government, where they can get data, how they can um, interpret it, how they cut it up by demographics. Um, and when we reconfirmed our agency of digital services, um, uh, Secretary uh, John Quinn, this is a conversation we had in great depth. And one of the things worth noting is that before the pandemic, we had about a million government interactions online, payments, you know, et cetera. In the pandemic, we had 5 million. That's not going to go back down anytime soon. People are getting really comfortable and we're making it easier to access government in a digital space. We need to know what that means. And if you ask John Quinn, he would say, we probably need to set aside a percentage of each project budget for a digital component. Just like we need to set aside, as Beth alluded to, a component for planning. For each project. So, you know, you can't even get to better planning unless you're structuring the budget in a way that you're acknowledging the different sort of 
the future of government itself, you know, which in many ways is going to look very different than what we do right now. That's, I, I think, a, a great point in terms of building a plan for the modernization or the, the ongoing and continuous modernization of uh, government interactions, right? You know, like I said, at, this, at the outset, 29 years ago, Amazon hadn't been created and very few of us had an email account if, if we did. Um, and so 29 years from now, how many more of those interactions with state government or municipal government are going to be, um, uh, it's not going to be less that are digital in nature. Um, and that offers abundant opportunity for us to think about improving the, the, the level and scale and integration of government services. So the, the, uh, and I'm going to overstate this for the sake of provocation, but we have this ethos uh, of local control in Vermont. Um, and uh, the question I have is, 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 t is threaded in the Q&A. But given the multitude of water districts, fire districts, 251 municipalities, regional planning commissions, regional development corporations, um, uh, district commissions for active fifth, is there an issue that planning can help us resolve related to the, uh, the complexity that evolves from the, the multitude and, and, and um, the, uh, and, and the variation between service territory, service objectives, um, jurisdictions, uh, otherwise, um, and other factors in that space. Um, are we so complex that it makes us hard to either come to a consensus or then build and or pursue a plan? Like I said, I'm overstating it to provoke the conversation a little bit. You know, the analogy in the in the chat is around county government. Would things be easier if we just had counties? There are more than a hundred counties that are bigger in this state, in this country, that are bigger than our entire state in terms of population. So I'll tell you a little story. When I first moved here, now keep in mind I came from a city of five million people um, and worked for a local government that had about uh, probably eight hundred thousand permanent residents and seven million summer res uh, visitors. So. Arriving in, at the time, I lived in Peth, Vermont, which is not really a town. It's a sort of subdivision of Randolph. But they had this thing called town meeting, which I went to, because, you know, they had a, they, it was that or Australian ballot, which I found fascinating because I'd never heard of Australian ballot before. Um, but at the town meeting, there was a conversation about, the school budget, well, there wasn't really this conversation about the school budget because the school budget was done on a on Australian ballot. But then there was a conversation in the, the town meeting about buying shovels. And it was totally fascinating to me as someone who'd just arrived. It was a little mind blowing that we spent as much time as we did on these shovels. And the reason we were buying the shovels was because we bought the year previously a new pickup and we spent more time on the shovels than we spent on the school budget um, just in terms of community conversation but I think it does, it's just illustrative of the local control challenge that we have and I, I think the question I've always asked myself is you know where does the feeling of control come from I mean you know do you you know do is getting to make those decisions actually giving you more control or not? Because it seems like there are some bigger forces at play and maybe that's where you know, the control might need to be. It's it's a challenging one. I, I've not, I've only been here for you know, 23 years. I haven't really wrapped my head around it yet. I, you know, I think we see it in school consolidation conversations. We see it in a bunch of things. Um, we see it, a great example for me is, you know, I live in Barrie. We have Barrie, Berlin, Montpelier um, having a conversation over years about whether they should share dispatch for emergency services. If I was king, we would have done that like years ago. It just doesn't, I don't understand. But I mean, there's a lot of issues. There's a lot of conversation goes on around it. I don't quite get it, but I think that 
you know, but as I said right at the beginning, I think ultimately whatever you settle on, it can be done well or it can be done badly. And I guess it's, I've always viewed it as just being incumbent upon us to do it well, whatever it is. And so I think that whilst local control has challenges in terms of cost um, and duplication, I think, you know, it's perhaps more a reason why we need to make sure we're talking to each other and understanding what each um, entity or player in that sort of web is doing such that we can minimize the duplication and work together even as we control things that are at sometimes almost micro local level. Other folks want to dive in on that? Well, I think we have some models uh, for regional cooperation. Um, and I, I, I thought it was interesting, the examples that were in the paper for this session, um, where regional economic development organizations and regional planning commissions are working cooperatively. But we have a law in Vermont, the Union Municipal District Law, which enables communities to come together and plan for whatever as jointly. And for example, the Mad River Valley back in the 80s got together and set up a municipal planning district between Warren Waitsfield and Faston. And they share a planning staff and it's a circuit rider between the communities. And that's been going for a long time. So there are a lot of op opportunities out there. And I think there are other models as well. Councils of governments have been used in other states. The most famous one is probably the Twin Cities in Minnesota, the Metro Council. Um, they're usually voluntary. The entities have to agree to come together, but I think there, there are a lot of options out there. And I sort of liked the approach set forth in the paper of let's, let's try this out. Let's see how this works in a few cases and see if we can make this work. And, and before we try to institute something that's mandatory for the entire state, for example, which I don't know how that would go over in Vermont. I'm not sure. I mean, I, I sort of like our local quirkiness. And I don't think anybody wants to lose the differences between the quirky differences between our communities, even though we need to cooperate more than we, we do now. Thanks, Beth. Other, uh, Tiff, you look like you're reaching for the unmute. I, I was. Uh, and I actually, this is a question for you, Beth, because I, um, but you're, you're not, you're not implying though, um, your support for local engagement and decision-making uh, isn't in conflict with uh, your um, support for a kind of centralized uh, process where certain state priorities are identified and, um, and, and planning is done as it relates to, you know, any number of kind of statewide challenges. Am I correct? You are correct. If we had state priorities that were clearly identified and a process for those to filter out, um, you, you are correct. We do have a process actually. I mean, the, the Growth Management Act that was passed in the eighties in Vermont requires that towns and regional planning commissions adhere to state standards. So we have already, we have a process in place whereby communities are supposed to be doing their planning in a cooperative way with consistent with state guidance. If that guidance gets more specific because we have a planning office and we have a new set of priorities, um, that should filter down. It <clears throat> sounds similar to what Bill Schubart wrote about in his latest, com his latest commentary and Here's where I really stumble is how do you commit to the long haul when you have a governor in office for two years? I won't even touch the legislator question, but a governor in office for two years, how, which I just think in it, it, it very so naturally lends itself to the shiny initiative that uh, will attract attention, perhaps be actionable in a short period of time, but not necessarily have long-term strategic benefits. Uh, I, 
I, I mean, I, I just don't. And how do you ensure that a planning office, where do you house a planning office? Is it within the administration that is then subject to the priorities of the governor? Or is it independent in some way, the way the joint fiscal office is um, and which serves a legislature? It, those are some really practical questions that I, I wrestle with and would love to hear people talk about. Yeah, that's, they're fascinating questions. I think that, um, and in some ways, I wouldn't even say the governor, you know, the fact that governor has a two-year term was the biggest problem there. It's, it's because governors are usually, um, you know, they, they usually have enough confidence to sort of do, they, they actually, I think they actually think further than their cabinet members do. So now you've got people who aren't even in privity, privy to when the governor's going to run or not run, and they're sort of looking at everything on two-year terms. You know, the only other state that does it is New Hampshire in terms of the two-year terms of governor, and you'll note that the, the cabinet secretaries in New Hampshire are not appointed by the governor. Um, it's a very weak governor that New Hampshire has. And so some of those cabinet secretaries last for a long time. So I used to think, and I'm not sure if I'm still there, I mean, but I used to think that Vermont needed something like a senior executive service, a sort of permanent public service type group of people who were hired on, and this is how they do it in Australia. The senior public service are all hired on contracts which tend not to line up with election cycles. So if there's a change in government and there's a change in party, not everyone who's running all the agencies disappears at the same time. There are usually on three or five year contracts that roll, you know, and so you get some consistency through the, the sort of public service as opposed to the, the um, sort of political service. And, I don't know, it's, it's, I'd have to think about it a lot more. And again, it falls into the too big to be small, too small to be big, sort of where would it fit? What would it cost? All that sort of stuff. But I think there's a lot to be said for more consistency. Um, you know, I think for all parties involved, having consistency and, and predictability would be helpful. And, you know, I think that we hear that in, in all kinds, I mean, I hear it from my clients these days about, oh, Vermont, you know, we can never decide whether we put money in or we don't because we never know what the outcome is going to be because we're never clear on what the price, you know. So, and then I hear it inside government as well. And, you know, it's, so I think that some mechanism to, for smoothing that out would be good, but maybe the simpler way would be just to go to a four-year term. And even <laughs> then that... <laughs> That's actually not very long. And what does that look like? You know, and, and does it apply to legislature? Does it apply, you know, should, you know, like in a lot of places, should the upper house or the, the Senate have a longer term than the lower house? You know, I use upper and lower. That's my Westminster stuff coming back. But um, it's all wrong in Vermont because completely different subject. But the colors are switched to everywhere else that I've ever been in the world too, which is very key. We'll deal with so that. let me let me ask the question differently, and then invite everybody because like, because I think it's a really interesting one. What are the conditions? We we the objective of a Vermont proposition work is to think over the course of the next thirty years. What is Vermont going to look like in, at twenty fifty? What are the conditions in place, or the systems that need to be in place? to actually create space for consensus-based planning, create space for us to actually build over time towards uh, solutions to some of the systemic problems we have in place, right? Whether it's our, our demographics. We've known about our demographics as a challenge for 30 years and, and, and we're not doing better. I mean, we're doing maybe marginally better holding water on them than we, we have been. Um, what, what, are the, what, what are the conditions in place for housing? You know, I've seen wastewater and, you know, I mean, but what? Are, but more importantly, like, are there barriers to government or, or barriers related to our current structure and our approach to governance that, that hold back ability our ability to actually think about things over some time? That that uh, that the Vermont proposition, whether whether it's the term of the governor, uh, whether it's the term of the legislature, the structure of a planning office, 
Um, there's, there's a reason we don't seem to make headway on these things. And uh, I asked that question, so what needs to be different between now and the end of this decade in order for us to have a system in place that can make headway on these things? Well, not to sort of uh, give a lot of, um, you know, kudos to, to Vermont Council on Rural Development, but I think it's appropriate here because they're one of the only organizations going into communities that one might identify as in need of, you know, planning and visioning, distressed in some way, or just large and, you know, sort of springboarding into the future. And they get buy-in from people and follow up with what folks actually want. Um, you know, I, I think one of the fallacies that I don't want us to get caught up in before we end is that planning is always about being efficient. You know, planning is also about making sure that people feel like they're part of the solution, that they were able to offer that input and be heard. And we will never solve our local versus state issue if people feel like something's being done to them at the state level. And if we, I'm looking at healthcare, which I barely want to touch as kind of a third rail here, but if we fatigue people with a new board or a new effort or something like a new reform initiative, and we don't even evaluate if it's working or doing what it was supposed to do, and then we move on to something else, or we just, you know, act like that's the sort of place to, to, to air your grievances or, or get progress and it's not working, then people lose trust in us because we're not evaluating the tools that we're already using. We're about to sprinkle lots of new money in places. And the, you know, again, some of the loudest voices came and said, give us money for this cool new idea. Fine. But then tell us, you know, how it's working. And, and you know, frankly, if you ask the people who, who got the money how it's working, it's going to be great. But, you know, how do you have an, an independent entity that's asking harder questions, that's comparatively answering, did this work? Was it worth the money? That's where I think you get to a lot of what people are saying about duplication. Um, and at some point, an institution that actually says, you know, this is the this is the standard way we're going to do things because that's what the data is informing us should be done and that you can't do that in Vermont unless you really build a lot of buy-in toward that and so you know when we think we've heard about something for the millionth time in Montpelier it doesn't mean that we've given the people who are most affected the ability to be heard on that and that's not an efficiency question that's a you know buy-in and engagement question I'm on the Government Accountability Committee. We have these 10 indicators for Vermont's future, like what, you know, quality of life indicators for the state. And people can go watch the tapes. I was fighting with a lot of other people in the Senate that we should just, you know, tweak them here and there and move on for another 10 years and have never asked Vermonters their opinion on these indicators. When they were created, we didn't ask Vermonters opinions. We had a public hearing where like four people came and we called that a day and that's not fair to Vermonters. So unless we really, you know, not only use data but give Vermonters an authentic voice in the process, we can't say, you know, that we've done what it takes that we have the best solutions. I, I just don't buy that, you know. So to me, it's not about efficiency. It's about, you know, really rowing in a direction that other people are with you in the boat. I, I just, um, I, I couldn't agree more about that. Um, I did want to just get back to the question of where would you locate such an office in my little nerd world of <laughs> no. trying to figure out how this is going to work. And I think uh, Tiff raises a really important point about the gubernatorial terms, but we did have a state planning office with two-year terms, and we did have consistent approach for a while, as long as that person was governor. Um, and when the governor changed, um, then we, we saw a shift. On the other hand, while that governor was in power, we got things done because the office of the state planning was in the governor's office. And so if there was an issue that came up and you had to knock two agencies heads together, you had the governor there saying, okay, my office is telling me this is what should be happening here. Um, and it was really important at that time. I don't, I don't, can't speak about today, but at that time, it was really important for it to be in the office of the governor, not buried in, in another um, major agency, because that's how things really got done and resolutions between agencies occurred. Great. There's a, 
And that's, it's, it's so helpful to have the history of the way it's been, it, it, it was once done, Beth, in terms, uh, I'm curious, you know, uh, Tiff, um, Geisha, Justin, you know, in your experience, I mean, it, uh, Justin, you came from a variety of different, you know, structures of government and places, but um, Tiff and Geisha, in, in researching the planning office exercise and the legislation, you know, where was, you know, where did you feel like had the most robust structure? Um, there's any examples. Another way of saying, you know, it, it, you know, 10 years from now, what should we have in place and what should we be revisiting and deciding if it worked? Really? I, I am just, oh, I'm sorry, Justin, go uh, ahead. Uh, I was just gonna say, I think, I agree. I think that the governor's office is the place for, it's got to report to the governor because it needs that if you're gonna move the administration along and a, a lot of this is is interaction between the agencies and we see it all the time when something's put in you know like purchasing is put in bgs and so everyone just blames bgs every time they have trouble purchasing so it, it'll just be that planning office is getting in the way of what we want to do the challenge though is to get it to the point where the planning office is robust enough and respected enough that no governor would ever consider not having it. I mean, it, it needs to be fundamental to government is what it needs to be, but then it really needs to be reporting to the governor and, and how you make that jump is a challenge. Thanks, Justin. Keisha, Tiff? Well, as Keisha mentioned, um, you know, we worked with uh, some um, amazing students at UVM who helped do a bunch of research on other initiatives that exist in uh, the United States and planning offices that are effective in, in um, their states and what they look like and what they focused on, et cetera, and looking for parallels to the legislation that we had proposed in the, um, in Colorado, you know, basically, the state planning office serves to kind of facilitate communication across localities and to provide technical assistance to localities. Then in Massachusetts, we really focused on ca managing capital projects and then tying those capital projects to climate goals. Um, Minnesota, I think, probably came closest to what we were thinking about. Um, but, uh, you know, one size doesn't fit. Uh, you know, Vermont's a lot smaller than Minnesota. So, and we have ways of doing things that we've done for a long time. And I think that each, I mean, the offices, it was very interesting to hear about their histories. They waxed and waned, they lost funding, they came back as something else. I, I just hope that whatever we are able to uh, put into place is, becomes vital and a, a continuous resource because you're never gonna recognize its value immediately. You're, you're only gonna see that over the long haul. So unless we're willing to give it the long haul and maybe that's it, I, you know, I, I think that it, it, uh, it won't have the desired effect that we've talked about. Thanks, Jeff. I just, you know, I just want to say, and I see, I see Mark's, you know, comment, who, who knows this stuff well, also about it being federal money. I don't think anyone's disagreeing with, you know, that it probably would require a lot of federal money. I think the reality is when we get federal money, we should be able to meet federal mandates and requirements for the money that we're spending. And that would probably require setting aside a percentage of all federal grants we received, all of these monies coming in for planning. So I don't want to, you know, leave this without saying, yeah, we're not, you know, we're not talking in many ways about a new funding source, but it would change how we think about our budget, just like with IT projects, etc. Um, you know, I think um, the the interesting thing about all of the other states we looked at, in my mind, was the personalities that drive them and the ways that other departments and agencies don't, you know, want them in, in certain corners. You know, they don't want them dealing with transportation issues, or they don't want them you know, dealing with certain things. So they all do have a personality of their own about where they found things that were orphaned in some way and took them under their wing and sort of gave them the life that they needed. Um, California and Hawaii will probably never catch up to them, I would say, 
but in many ways, I thought they had the most comprehensive sense of where are low income or distressed or marginalized communities and how do we make sure things like electric vehicle infrastructure and disaster recovery dollars and other monies get into those communities. I mean, you you can ask Senator Kitchell, you know, who did an incredible job again with a, a Herculean task of this budget. And she just said, I just want to make sure, you know, the money is is not just going to the loudest voices, but the people who need it the most. And, you know, that does take some science to know what you're doing. And you can just look at some really brilliant documents from West Coast states, Minnesota, Massachusetts even, and see that they can answer those questions. You know, how much of a percentage of these funds are going to the most low income communities? What is that doing? What is the impact that it's having? They're not perfect states, but you know, to the extent we can't answer those questions, we're, we're behind you know, the infrastructure other states have to get at answering those questions, even though there are certain agencies and departments that don't want, you know, they want to do their own planning and they don't want the planning office around. And that was interesting for us. Thank you. <clears throat> so uh, I would, I, I just got pinged because I think we're wrapping up and we're just about out of time. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I encourage everybody to follow up with any of our panelists. You know, I think our contact information or communicate uh, is in the, um, the Whova uh, platform and there are some uh, events later on. I don't know if everybody's planning on participating or not, but um, both uh, Keisha and Tiff are you know, um, engaged in this work from a policymaking perspective and um, Justin and Beth, you know, you're not going anywhere, you've been here. So um, the conversation I, I think is a really important one it, it, uh, because it's hard to, in my view, when you step back, and this is the, the role of philanthropy in our work, at, and also our work uh, as a board member at the Vermont C Council of Rural Development, thinking about trends over time. And the question I, I would ask you to wrestle with as you leave is, what, what, how, do, how do we build confidence in our ability or shared ability as a state to make progress on the big challenges we face over time, absent a structure that is guiding our decision making? Um, and I, and I, I, it's hard for me to recognize the structure right now that guides our decision making beyond a year or two of a, a, a public budgeting process and a legislative session. Uh, and we need the confidence to be able to make shared decisions, whether it's long-term investments in wastewater for municipalities to create dense, affordable downtown housing, uh, whether it's around climate infrastructure and um, electrical vehicles and that kind of infrastructure, whether it's the you know the the, the, the human development of uh, higher education and workforce. Um, you know there there's a universe of things that we need to be making decisions about right now that. Uh, will guide us over the course of the next 20 years. And this discussion and this proposition is really about what's the framework that gives us the best chance to make headway for Vermonters on those things. So I wanna thank you all for um, the thought and the history and the work you've put into Vermont communities over. And, and I know there's a, a, a whole slew of comments that we didn't get to in the chat, but I do wanna just thank everybody for their engagement, acknowledge you all and you know honor the time right now. So thank you so much. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Thank you all.